Calculus, brought to you by Newton and Leibniz, and the letter D, studied by students like you. A branch of mathematics that completely changed the modern world and how science is used, but what exactly is it? A short answer? Calculus deals with two main components, derivation, the study of instantaneous change, and integration, the area under the curve. These tools are used in a host of wide disciplines such as mathematics, physics, and economics. But where did it come from? Who invented this? Two men are given credit for this invention, Sir Isaac Newton and Gottfried William Leibniz. I don't know if I'm saying that right. To know the story of calculus, we have to get to know both of these men a little better. Let's start with Newton. Sir Isaac Newton, considered one of the world's greatest scientists, if not the greatest, was a man of many interests. His work in optics led him to discover that white light was really made up of many colors, and he invented the more powerful mirror-used telescope, a design modified through time to give us later great telescopes such as Hubble and Webb. His work in optics granted him membership to the Royal Society, an elite group of scientists. A deeply quiet and reserved man, he mostly kept to himself and collaborated as needed. It wasn't until after the influence of Edmund Halley that he published his Principia which included his three laws of motion as well as his law of gravitation. As if greatest scientist wasn't impressive enough, this book is revered as the greatest scientific volume of all time. Well done, Newton. William Gottfried Leibniz. You know what, let's just call him Leibniz from now on. I can't even say that very well. A German child prodigy gaining his master's degree in philosophy by age 18 also took many interests. Unlike Newton, he traveled a great amount, collaborating with those he could, the number of scholars in his network said to be around 600. He contributed greatly to the works of philosophy, physics, and of course, mathematics. His calculating machine granted him, too, membership into the Royal Society. But how could they both come up with calculus? What questions led them to their invention? Newton took the problem of planetary motion, but he needed a tool for calculating instantaneous change. This shaped his geometrical approach to tangents. Leibniz, a lover of logic, took a different approach. He was looking at the areas under a function. Knowing the area of a rectangle, he thought he could approximate the area under a curve by placing these shapes he knew how to calculate. Using smaller and more rectangles, he'd get a better approximation. If he could find the smallest area in those rectangles, he would have it. There were some differences and similarities between these two men's calculi. Calculuses? I digress. Leibniz paid keen attention to notation. With the universal language in mind, he spent a great amount of time coming up with the useful notation that made sense for all calculations. The elongated S we see when working with integrals was his symbol for summation. Also, the D we see in expressions like dy dx is a symbol for difference. Newton, creating calculus without great interest in publication, kept a different set of notations. If x was his fluent, then x with a dot upon it was his fluxion, what he used as derivative. We still see this notation today in the use of physics, but this wasn't his only one. His notes also include box characters or other ways of indicating derivatives or integrals, but he didn't call them as such. He used the terms mentioned before, fluence and fluxions. Differential calculus and integral calculus were also given to us by Leibniz. Two things are similar. The use of infinitesimals, numbers not quite zero, but as infinitely small as you can think without being zero, was one they both could not get around. Their use received much criticism from the mathematical community, with George Berkeley calling them the ghosts of the parted quantity. Newton tried to avoid such scrutiny by using his method of primes and ultimate ratios. This still wasn't a strong foundation for calculus, and it wasn't until later mathematicians such as Cauchy and Weierstrauss gave their work on limits the solid foundation we now learn and build upon within calculus. Then it was wholly accepted. The other thing they did similarly was the fundamental theorem of calculus. 
Both men realized that derivatives and integrals were related, and if you knew one, the other could be calculated. Now, as contemporaries who both claim to have invented calculus, a conflict arose! This dispute was a great one that lasted for many years, even brought to the Royal Society with Newton having taken presidency. It is no surprise that the argument went in Newton's favor. Even after Leibniz's death, the debate went on, but it was still decided that both men deserve credit, with Leibniz having first published in 1684, but for Newton first discovering it in 1666. This shown by his unpublished notes. Such a nasty controversy, it is still a question. Should we even be arguing over who gets what credit, or should we view it as a collaboration of the great minds through time? Without the works of older greats such as Archimedes, Fermat, Descartes, and many more, the list is too long to draw, they could not have furthered the development. Without previously mentioned works by Cauchy and Weierstrauss, calculus couldn't be considered the rigorous branch of mathematics we know of today. Either way, many thanks can be given for all contributions throughout history for a mathematical tool that revolutionized science and the world as we know it. But that is another story and shall be told another time. Oh, calculus, you are so great. With infinitesimal time, we never have to wait. Oh, calculus, you are fantastic. In economics you can give us a demand of elastic Oh calculus, I know this song is bad I just needed something to fill the rest of the time I had in.